friends, and welcome to We're Already Here, a podcast about celebrating who we are, the highs and lows in our lives, and understanding the story that we've created for ourselves. Today, I am here with Ariana. Ariana is a nonprofit development professional based in Philly. She has over 15 years experience in public service and is a recipient of the highest national service award. Through these 15 years, she's completed two years of service with City Year in Philadelphia, starting right out of high school. She was the youngest executive director of a nonprofit called Teenagers Inc. in the Northwest section of Philadelphia. She's helped build seven houses in Guatemala with Nuestro Aijados. And she interpreted a Black Lives Matter protest in the summer of 2020. Outside of all this awesome work, she ran her first marathon in Athens in 2019. A little bit more by way of background, Ariana went to school to become a sign language interpreter and is currently in school to get a degree in organizational leadership. Finally, and what I'm super excited to talk about today, she is also a strong advocate for communication advocacy, accessing communities, and building inclusive communities. So Ariana, this is so cool. I'm so excited that we're speaking together. Um, first off, how are you? And thank you for joining me. I'm good. Uh, it's Sunday night, you know, finishing out, finishing out the, uh, rounding out the evening with a little conversation with you and um, just excited to talk about things that are passionate to me and talk about things that are, you know, complicated and fun and interesting to see how people uh, react to life. And that's, that's fun to me. Totally, totally. And anyone who's been listening consistently knows that complicated and fun conversations is everything that I love to do here. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, why don't you tell me and the listeners a little bit more about yourself and your work? Sure. So I am born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, I am a first generation kid on my dad's side who's from Athens, Greece. My mom is from Philadelphia. I am the proudest Philadelphian Greek American, I feel like <laughs> in, in the city. Um, I, you know, sort of fell into um, being a proud Philadelphian sort of later in life. I feel like I didn't really understand the city until I actually did city year. And I had the opportunity to sort of um, travel, travel throughout the city, really get to know the ins and outs and like the highs and lows of what Philadelphia is. Um, and if you don't know what City Year is, the City Year is a national nonprofit. It helps to address the dropout crisis in, in uh, urban areas or inner city spaces. And there is uh, about 25 City Year sites all over the United States um, and one in England and one in South Africa. Um, so I've been a part of City Year uh, for 20-ish years because I uh, finished high school a little before that. And um, so yeah, I've been kind of helping with their alumni board for a long time and uh, still hanging out with some of my favorite people from there and kicking it service style. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I love how you mentioned like you became more proud of the city, fell in love with Philadelphia after seeing the highs and the lows. Cause I think it's just like, uh, that's obviously the tagline of this podcast. Um, I feel like you can't really appreciate something truly in its full form unless you've seen both the highs and the lows of it. So that's so beautiful. I'm willing um, to accept yeah. the highs and the lows of it too. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Through your work in City Year, which I actually was totally unaware of what the organization did till now, uh, for my own interest, what did you find was the biggest cause of dropout rates and also what tended to be most effective in lowering those dropout rates? Sure. So when I did City Year, it was about a hundred years ago. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, but City Year still is alive and well, and, and, and they're doing the real dropout work crisis, uh, you know, sort of uh, analyzing and util utilizing data to, to look at that. And mostly they go on benchmarkers. So it's like uh, uh, attendance behavior and like grades and things like that. So they they sort of do um, and see where they can fit in. And there's a lot of tutoring and mentoring and sort of a, what I like to call sort of um, filling in the gaps within the school uh, setting. So across the United States, there's a serious effort to ensure equal access to education, but not only middle school education going into high school and then furthering their education through college. So there is a, there's, there's sort of a, a pattern that they follow, they do the work, um, I think what they've found in the dropout rate um, 
or what the cause of that was, was mostly, you know, we have a systemic education issue already. And a lot of our inner city spaces sort of um, fall into those traps with lack of funding, lack of resources and things like that. So city year sort of helps to um, maintain those like positive, happy spaces that school can be. And then from there sort of um, helps to utilize and, and uh, create curricula that will um, make learning not only accessible to people who don't really feel like learning or don't really feel like their school is serving them in that way, sure. but also just helping them understand that like, listen, we're all in this together. This is, you're not alone in algebra. There's 30 other kids that also are struggling and, you know, City Year creates, City Year members uh, make sure that their work is some of the best work that they're doing that day. And they come in, you know, ready to go and uh, help to make sure that these kids will succeed. When That's I did really City great. Year, I ran a service program for high school students, um, and I was just out of high school. And remember that because 20 years later, I ran a service program for high school students when I was mm -hmm. much later, much older. Um, so my life pretty much hit full circle uh, because I got to do two lots of the things that I really love. And working with City Year sort of gave me those. Uh, guidepost throughout my life to sort of know that I could handle whatever situation I was going to be in. Sure. And like, what a critical age to be working with your community. Like, I just feel like those teenage years, especially like those later high school teenage years, that could have such a huge impact on the trajectory of your life. So what, what an impactful group to be doing that with. As I mentioned in your intro, one thing that we'll be talking about a ton in this conversation is communication advocacy. So what do you do in your work pertaining to that? And what exactly is communication advocacy? Sure. So I um, had a deaf babysitter when I was five and I, and I was a big watcher of Sesame Street, um, but mostly the deaf babysitter, the, the woman that helped me understand how to clearly communicate in another language. Um, I, you know, you and I are both first generation kids to this country. Mm -hmm. um, so we already sort of had a background of what learning a language was like for our parent. Um, I got to learn and understand what a language was like for somebody that was born in this country with a complete and total barrier to any sound or any access to what information they needed. And I was five when I learned American Sign Language or started the keys to learning American Sign Language. Um, I'm an interpreter on the collegiate level and that is a fun job because I get to dip in and out of college classes along with my own educational journey, but I get to help another young person on their um, sort of advocacy journey and learning how to make sure that they have full access to the, the accommodations that they need. As an interpreter, you're the accommodation, you're one of many accommodations, but uh, when you are sort of young and you know, colleges are busy places, people are busy. There's lots of students to keep track of, lots of lessons to learn, and sometimes things fall through the cracks. So I, looking at a whole picture when I, you know, meet my student or whatever the case is, we can sort of see what they need. And knowing that I'm already accommodation, knowing that I have uh, like their ear, I can sort of say, hey, maybe you want to think about some other things that would help you along your, um, your, your educational path to make sure that you mm -hmm. have full range of information and full access to the things that you need in order to be successful. Um, and while I sort of fell into sign language interpreting because sign language was my sort of my second language, I fully embraced the idea that like, there's only, there's not one thing a deaf person can't do. It's the only thing they can't do is they can't hear. Sure. Um, and I think that, you know, I've been a part of the deaf community sort of on the periphery involved heavily in working in schools, in classrooms, um, you know, sort of volunteering on a very like outside level, but no matter what space I've been in with the deaf community, I really feel very passionately that some of the most um, wonderful encounters I've had with these individuals have always been um, really rooted heavily in how best as a hearing person I can advocate for them in a larger setting. Oh, I'm sure. And I'm sure a lot of these like younger people also aren't aware of the full suite of services available to them, mm -hmm. which I think is also pretty critical. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the, some of the things that, you know, as hearing people, we sort of go through the world and we want to, you know, want to help or change or whatever the case is, but sometimes we have to take a, a seat back and say like, okay, here are the things that like, I know that I can do and I can bring to the table. What are the things that you actually need before I like overstep my boundary and sort of like, sure. Yeah. Want to take, take credit for it. That's, that's kind of hitting a nerve in my brain right now is even if you know the service is available to you, I feel like as a young person and like, I'll say for, on my behalf as like a young woman, right? You don't always feel comfortable comfortable advocating for yourself in that way. And like you said, colleges are busy places. It's one of those things where like you say it once, you say it twice, you say it three times and you're still not getting what you need. So I can imagine mm -hmm. as like a person in the deaf community who in many ways has had to change how they interact with the world because this world is not made to accommodate them. Like I'm right. sure when you're a young person have lived your whole life adjusting to a world that is not accommodating to you. It's so much harder to ask that fourth, fifth, sixth time until you get what you need. So I, I'm totally, totally there with you. Like, like you said, like without stepping a boundary, you need someone to step in. who's going to be like, no, this is what you deserve. And like, keep asking until you get it. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think it helps to have an, like an adult to your adult. Oh, <laughs> you know? totally. I, I mean, I'm <laughs> there with you. <laughs> I've been um, out of college for four years and I still sometimes want an adult. <laughs> I mean, I, I would by all intents and purposes be an adult in my later years now. And I'm still like, is there someone smarter than me around that can just do this? Because I'm done. <laughs> like, right. Thank but, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, so I, awesome. I hear that. Yeah. So why is this work important to you personally? Um, I, like I said, I, I think I've been a part of the deaf community for an upwards of 20 plus years. I've worked with within the schools. I've worked with organizations um, and I've always worked with a kid, you know, in, in some shape or form, whether it be a, a deaf child or a hearing child. But I've always been around um, somebody who has who, you know, is either needing interpreting services or is deaf themselves. And we're just friends and hanging out. And I think that um, the work is important to me because this world, like you said, this world is not accommodating to everybody. And I know that as a hearing person in this world, the only thing I want to do is make sure everybody is up to that equal access. Absolutely. I think that as people, as humans, you know, we are here to sort of make it, to bridge that gap. And if we're not bridging that gap, what are we doing? You know, like right. we have access to all kinds of things. We have access as hearing people, as women as men, um, you know, we saw a lot of movement in 2020 about like making sure we have equality and making sure we have fair voices. And one of those things that like, that wasn't thought about was like, hey, what about these protests? Like, what about, you know, what about the idea that like somebody, somebody deaf might wanna also be a part of it. And sure. really it started with a question. A young girl that I've known for years, she was like, hey, this is happening in our neighborhood. Will you be there? And I was like, now I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Go? I mean, I was going, I'd been, you know, I'd been to a bunch of protests, but you know, what's one more and I'm available. Let's make this work. So, you know, it was, it's something that has always, this community has always been very important to me. It, it Again, like you think about the things that shape you, you think about your educational journey, you think about your, you know, family, you think about your parents and like, you know, all the things that shape you for who you are. The deaf community shaped me because I've been a part of it for so long. Sure, and, sure. You know, I'm sure you've gone to big events and people have always been like, oh, I remember you when you were. And then like, yeah, start with yeah. when, when you were, and that happens to me. I remember when you were little and you're now all grown up. And it's mm. like having that, having people like that through my whole life, you can't help but to advocate for them. Of course, of course. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah, that's definitely powerful. So as individuals, what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives? Because if you're listening to this podcast, you're a hearing person. Um, what can we do in our day-to-day -day lives to increase communication access? I mean, I would start out with, with learning sign language. You know, I think it's, it's not an easy language to learn, but if you're already bilingual, you already got it in your brain. You know, you already know how to translate and interpret. You don't have to be an interpreter, but like, 
you know, if, if you're, if you're out in the street and you see somebody who, you know, might be a deaf tourist, if you're from a touristy town, or, you know, if you're working and there's like a deaf person on staff, um, learn a little sign language. The alphabet goes a long way. Also, you know, everybody in their respective fields feels some kind of way about hiring a person with a disability mm -hmm. that needs to end mm -hmm. like across the board wheelchair, you know, mm -hmm. person that can't see and is blind, a person that is deaf. Those people have full, adequate, wonderful lives. Employment is a step to bridge that gap to make mm -hmm. us all equal. So if you're listening and you are like the CEO of, you know, this fortune 500 company, God, I hope one of them are listening. I mean, oh my honestly, gosh. <laughs> I feel like it should be, <laughs> or even if you're a small business and you, you know, you're sure, somewhere in the middle yeah. of, you know, wherever New York or Philadelphia, I have wherever, plenty of like, small business owners listening. So listen, exactly up. like tap in also like a, a deaf person on your staff or a person in a wheelchair, like you're doing them not only the biggest like return on justice, but you're creating a space that's, that's equal. And, you know, I go to work every day and I'm grateful that somebody is like, Hey, I want you to do those things. And I'm like, yeah. excellent. <laughs> I can yeah. do those things that sort of gets isolating. And then you feel like the, the world doesn't really want you. And that's just neglect. Yeah. So no, you're absolutely right. And also as a business owner, as a CEO, if you're listening, I want you to come on this podcast. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Manifest, baby. Manifest. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it's not even like you're doing anyone a favor by having people with disabilities on your team. You are inviting a new perspective onto your team. You are inviting people who have operated in this world differently than you have their entire lives onto your team. They are going to have ideas that you will never come up with. They're going to have a perspective that you could never have. So I think it's like you are only benefiting yourself by hiring people with disabilities. I agree. And, you know, not only that, there are companies that are doing wonderful jobs, you know, Google, uh, Comcast, uh, these like larger, larger places that, that know, you know, that know that they have people out there that have expertise. I mean, there are colleges in this world that cater to specifically the deaf population, but also most colleges have wheelchair accessible, you know, spaces. So obviously people in wheelchairs are, are still getting higher education. They're still doing these things because they, one, deserve it. Two, they're humans. And three, like, who are we to say, oh, you know, you can't have this job because just because. Sure. And I think that it really it really like sets fire to everything in me when I hear like of any sort of, you know, inequality in the world. But when I hear that, like, oh, you know, some so-and-so didn't get the job because I don't think they can do it because they can't hear or because they, or, you know, putting limitations on, on roles in, in this world. And it's like, well, well, wait a minute. Uh, that could be me too. You know, right. That could be any of us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not, not able to do something because of, and I just think, you know, with a little training and some sensitivity <laughs> to, the, to how the world works, this world could definitely benefit from, from having um, any sort of member on their team, like you said, just to provide perspective, but also like, let's use that, let's use that ADA budget to make sure that we're doing it for the right, right reasons. Totally, totally. And then what if we're not business owners? Like what if we're just regular people? operating through the world, what can we do to help increase communication access? Just like in our own um, circles. Yeah. I mean, if you are, I always say just be inclusive, learn, learn more about the history of the ADA. It, it is not, it is not old, you know, like there are things that are antiquated. There are things that there are some of these, um, sort of movements that have been around forever. And, and while the ADA has been around forever, their wins are very recent. Um, and I'm talking like 1980s, like recent, recent. 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 <laughs> so like if I don't want, I don't want to be old, but like recent, re I was still, I was still a little girl when they were still getting curb cuts, you know, like that's not okay. Um, that means for a long time, people in wheelchairs couldn't go out of their house without having to like figure out where a driveway was to safely cross the street. Sure. Sure. And then if you live in a city that doubles the sort of 
um, the safety factor. But also, you know, if we're we are a a world of social media, we are a world of um, handheld information coming at you quickly. If we're going live on Instagram, they have those caption buttons. Mm. If you're an influencer and you want to build your following, I have a life hack for you, y'all. <laughs> like, <laughs> hit that caption button and let it do the work for you because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, you want to you want to reach as many people as possible. Maintain eye contact with somebody who who is in a wheelchair or who is in, deaf, in the deaf community. Make sure you're looking at someone in the eye. One, it's a great life skill and two, like let's not be afraid to connect with someone who's different from us. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a conversation we always have, but like, let's really try in 2022 to connect with somebody who's different with us with, uh, with some serious eye contact and just, you know, reading lips is fine. But like I said, the alphabet is all over the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, Yeah. Even I know the sign language alphabet. (laughs) (laughs) If you can spell your name and you can say nice to meet you and you can do all those things, that is something that makes people feel like you they're doing something right in this world by existing. And you wanna just make sure everybody feels like they're existing for a purpose. Totally, absolutely, absolutely. Um, can we, can you teach me now how to say hi, nice to meet you? Cause I don't, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> we'll do um, it. It's hi. Okay, hi. hi. It's like I'm with, the, then, I'm with the microphone. I'll put this on my Instagram too, so everyone can learn. So hi. <laughs> and then nice. Nice. Mm-hmm. And then two people t- like running into each other, meet you. You. Mm-hmm. So hi, nice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay, wait. Okay, so hi, uh-huh. nice. Nice meet. to meet you. You. Mm-hmm. Okay, there. great. Hi, nice to meet you. There you go. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> so there was a quick language learn. And I think that that is something that uh, it's a skill that everybody will need and a skill that you now have. It's a little bit of a, a superpower that you can speak to people who, who need a little bit of extra, you know, feeling of purpose. <laughs> totally, totally, totally. Uh, just a random thought that came to my head. So I've seen on social media where it would be like image description. Mm-hmm. So I another knew- one on my list. How, how do those, so how do those work on like the if receiving you have a perspective? Screen, sure. So if you're, if you're a blind person and you have a screen reader on your um, phone, so the iPhone can do it. I, I'm sure Android phones can do it too. If you um, look on Instagram or look through Facebook and you're sort of just scrolling through, it'll say image description detected, and then it'll read back the image description. Oh, so cool. like, yeah. So that's something that is like also, you know, a person with a disability that can't see very well and they don't have to necessarily be legally blind, but anybody that wears glasses and like at nighttime doesn't feel like, you know, dealing with vision sure, yeah. <laughs> or anybody that just needs that extra um, something read to them in order to understand people with audio processing disorders, people mm-hmm. with, um, if you're, if you're trying to, if you're like good at multitasking and you're like trying to study or like trying to read something, but also you have to do something else and you want to sort of listen, have, it's almost like an audio book. You can like, it'll read to you what that image is. Mm-hmm. So it'll just, it'll make the, make the, um, the content again, accessible to everybody that might have a, a visual disability. Totally. Very cool. We chatted a little bit the last time we spoke about the politicization of disability rights. Can we talk a little bit more about that? Sure. I think it happened more so. I mean, I think it happens all the time, but I think really something that we can sort of look at is this wonderful pandemic that we are still experiencing. Mm-hmm. And I know and we're, you know, both in hot spots, but um, I think that rationing of care was mentioned in this. And that is hard to hear, right? Because like in a medical setting, you assume as anybody would that everybody gets care. Um, and in, doctors have to make ethical decisions all the time. And that is that is the truth. As an interpreter, I have to make an ethical decision all the time. Do I want, does that deaf person need all that information? The answer is always yes. Um, but <laughs> for a doctor, and it's sad, it's a sad thing to hear. The example that I've sort of heard and, and read about was like, 
you know, if two people have COVID, one person is a person with severe disability, maybe they're quadriplegic, or maybe they have cerebral palsy, or maybe they have something that like, um, isn't going to provide them with a functional and sort of like, what are they going to give back to the world stuff? Um, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. are they going to work what, after they get better? What are they going to do after they get better? Sure, sure. And then you have someone who's, you know, perfectly functioning and like, doesn't have any disabilities and they're just some rando person that was exposed at a party because of whatever the case is. And they're both really sick. Who's, ca what care, who, are the, who is the doctor going to administer care for first? Sure, sure. Are they going to give it to the person with the disabilities that might not lead that life? Or are they going to give it to the person that doesn't have anything wrong with them? And, you know, hey, if we get him out of the waiting, uh, we get him out of the emergency room, he'll at least be okay. But so mm. we can, we can sort of hold off on this person. And that's one of the examples I've heard and I've read about. And another one was, um, like we mentioned, uh, I talked to you before about curb cuts and especially in Philadelphia. And I know New York too, with the streeteries, mm -hmm. um, they're very fun, right? New York, I'm sure, and Philadelphia have sort of created this whole like streetery community. Whole outdoor eating, yeah. everything. Yeah, they're like separate Anything rooms at this want. point. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. And you can have you can have a safe meal outside. That is their that's their like tagline. Come join us at a restaurant. We have outside seating, we have heat lamps, we have the whole nine. Right. They're taking up sidewalk space that is to be used for wheelchairs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Why are you doing that? And then I know specifically in one part of Philadelphia, they have, it says like, if you're not eating at this restaurant, don't use our sidewalk. Okay, but like, who are you to tell me I can't walk down the street? Just because sure. I'm not, like, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I also think that's like totally illegal in New York. I don't know the Philadelphia <laughs> laws, but I think, like totally I think it not is. allowed. <laughs> So there is a whole like public radio article about WHYY, like put out a whole like study about, you know, curb cuts and who, you know, you know, that they're needed um, and you can't block them from people. So there's a lot of like political discussion about like, you know, going forward in this pandemic now with a new variant, now with all this stuff, like how are we going to sort of like keep up what we've been doing for the last two years? But in addition to that, we've left out a lot of people including in, you know, including people with disabilities within, within access to information. Um, you know, it, it was a beautiful day. I will tell you like as sad as March, 2020 was to like leave everything and like work from home and change our lives drastically. Seeing interpreters on the news was like a good day, <laughs> you know, like totally, seeing interpreters totally provide that pertinent and like totally important information to anyone that needs a sign language interpreter. That was the day that was like a, all of a sudden everybody woke up and was like, oh, right. There are people out here that use these services. We should 100% be using these services all of the time. Totally. And, you know, as the pandemic waned on, as the information became less and less, it turned more digital, it turned less interactive. And again, people were forgotten about. Mm. So there's always this like uptick of like, okay, we wanna make sure everybody has the right information. We wanna make sure everybody's doing the right thing. And then it goes away. And much like everything, it's forgotten about. Mm. How can we never forget about people? How can right. we do that? And that to me just seems like, we were doing so good, y'all. <laughs> we got it. Yeah. You know, like the world was e was almost equal. Yes. For like a minute. For a minute. And that's so much the human condition. I feel like that happens with everything. We get like really excited about something. We get really, really good at it. And then all of a sudden it dissipates and something else happens. Like yeah. it's, I mean, you saw that with the huge rally behind the Black Lives Matter movement in June 2020. Um, mm -hmm. the the um like some organizations were getting more donations in that in that mm -hmm. one week than they had gotten in however many years of their operations. Like, and then all of a sudden it mattered less to everyone. Like, it's just, that's such a good and point. Like, how do we, with, how do we mediate this? How do we resolve this? Yeah. And I just, you know, it's, it, it's not costing anybody any more money to add an interpreter because it's sure. already, the ADA has it in your budget, <laughs> you know, like, 
look, break down your budget, guys. You know, all the all the Fortune 500 companies that are listening, break down that budget. <laughs> look at what those that ADA budget is and like create space for people that provide information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same thing, equal access to information. Right, right. I want to know what she knows. Sure, how do I know absolutely. That? Because how do I want that? Or how do I know that it's important? It's because like that person is doing their job better because they know more. Right. And they only know more because someone told them. So I should know that too. That's why there's such a push to get diversity in boardrooms. That's yeah. where information flow is all going. The board gets filled in on essentially everything that matters. When you just look at your own operations in your life, like whether you're a small business or whether you're just a person operating in this world, everybody in their life has like a board, right? Mm -hmm. That like helped you to make decisions. Even think about that in your own life, like getting like diversify your personal board. If there was someone on your personal board who had any, any, like say, say they were deaf, like increasing access to that. It might sound a little lofty and like, oh, this, th this doesn't pertain to me, but it absolutely does. It pertains to every single one of us. Uh, yeah. And I think you bring up a great point about nonprofit boards and boards in general. It's like, we have, we have such a, you know, creating nonprofits was like the thing to do in 2020. And I, you know, as someone who is a lifelong nonprofit or who ran their own nonprofit, who did all those board trainings and who tried her best to make it diverse and make it meaningful and, you know, make and, and show parallel between like the United States and going to Guatemala to build houses. I mean, like the amount of work that that takes is exhausting, but the outcome of it, the outcome of showing homelessness in America and homelessness in Guatemala and seeing those parallels and drawing that, like the opportunity to do that do, is not lost on me, one. And mm -hmm. two, like mm -hmm. the opportunity to show young people that same thing also not lost on me, you know, like mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're better people for it. And they still tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Always. They're like, totally. we're going to do this service again. And because of you, because of this. So like, if anyone's going to create diverse situations for themselves, make sure you remember why you started. And that is something mm -hmm. that like, I have to think about all the time. Why mm -hmm. have I always, why do I want this? Why have mm -hmm. I started talking about communication advocacy? Why have I started talking about advocacy in general? Because these, the people that are not able to get that same information, we need that to bridge that gap. It's the only way we're going to get through this life. Totally, totally. And that's why what I do is so focused on emotions because you're only going to get people committed to something and consistently commit committed to it. If they have an emotional appeal for it, if they have Absolutely. an emotional reason to do it, you can logic yourself into oblivion, but unless you are emotionally invested in a goal, that's how you maintain consistency. So I think you bring up such an incredible point is like, get emotionally invested in this stuff. Yeah. And your emotional investment while like is a vulnerable place for a lot of people to be, you, you know, your emotional investment in your own life, your emotional investment in your work, your emotional investment in your quality time with your family, all those emotional investments that you put in, like, you know, goes into a conversation about like protecting energy, but also like that energy that you put out there and that you show how vulnerable you are and being able to like cater to different communities and different um, avenues in your life just makes you like a better person, but also Absolutely. just shows other people that, wow, I can see that you really care about all this stuff. And that like is tenfold for your future. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it all compounds like, okay. So there was a study that was done a while ago where basically people were given $5 and they were given $5 said spend it on whatever you want, or they were given $5 and said, spend it on someone else. Basically they like ask people after they spent the $5, whether they spent it on themselves or they spent it on someone else, the like feelings of satisfaction of the people who spent it on someone else were way higher than the people who spent the $5 on themselves. So yeah. it's like, yeah, sure. It's an energetic spend to care about other people, mm -hmm. but that level of positive feelings and satisfaction you'll get after it far outweighs the extra level of energetic spend that you're putting out there. Yeah. And at the end of the day, you know, you're, you're, you are helping somebody. And yeah. like, you know, if we're out here to make a difference, we're out here to be that change. We're out here to do all those things. Let's do it right. You know, if we're totally. not going to, if we're going to talk about it, if we're going, like you said, logic from here to there and, and have like big board meetings about DEI and, you know, making sure that like, oh yeah, I guess like 
maybe we should talk to Fred down in maintenance and bring him up. Sure, you know, like, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, sure. You know, that's, that's good. You should totally do that. But also like, let's deep dive into creating change from that bottom up because that structural change, as we know, on a larger scale could turn into something that, you know, all of a sudden there's interpreters on the news every night. All of a sudden there's right. image descriptions in every, in, on every photo that you post, you know, every single juncture and every single step of the way you have something right in front of you that you've made that difference for. Mm -hmm. And that tangible difference, you've got gold. Yeah, totally. These last few questions I asked to every guest who comes onto We're Already Here. Mm -hmm. This podcast is all about celebrating the lows just as much as the highs in your life. Can you tell me about a struggle in your life that sucked while you were going through it, but looking back now, you celebrate it? What did that struggle give you that you cherish today? Sure. So I guess it's good that we're talking about emotional investments because I had a, quite an emotional investment that sort of bought, gutted me. And um, I talk about it openly now. And I even thought about, you know, maybe changing my emotional investment conversation, but I'm glad that I didn't. Um, I had a multiple of years in a row where um, I felt that I, I just lost my footing, you know, like I have all these skills of like nonprofit work and I, and I really wanted to put them to good use in a space that did advocate for deaf individuals, deaf students. Um, and I worked really hard, you know, I got grants, I did all these things, I did all the right things. And then within seconds, within a year, pretty much, but it felt like seconds, they closed sure. all of those like avenues and closed that position. So that emotional investment of a whole year of my life mm -hmm. that I gave to get nothing in return. Mm -hmm. It's like, I thought, my God, what did I do? You know, is it me? Is it this? Is it, did I write something? Did I not write something? Sure. Yeah. A rational brain. I was like, this happens all of the time, Ariana. You you study business, you know this stuff. You understand that like people have to make cuts to budgets because it's expensive to keep you on, maybe. Or like maybe it's just not worth it. Somebody else could sort of absorb that role and it wouldn't be, you know, you wouldn't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But in my irrational thought, I was like, you done messed up. This is your sure. fault. Yeah. Why have I you done this? Um, yeah. and how could you, how could you mess up at a space where you're so good at it? Mm. And all of a sudden it's not for you. That's really tough. And that emotional investment as, as passionate I am, as I am about communication advocacy and that emotional investment in that world, that's what I was doing. I got a chance to actually see tangible evidence of showing yeah. politicians, like real people who work in Harrisburg, my tiny little space where like utopia is formed and like we're mm -hmm. all signing, <laughs> you know, like this is, this is what it looks like. And to not have that anymore gutted me. And I really lost my footing. I really thought I have to start again mm -hmm. because that's what you do, right? You like bottom out, mm -hmm. you you're, like Marianne Williamson says, like, you don't know real struggle or whatever until your knees hit the ground and you have to change everything. Mm -hmm. That's paraphrasing. Look up that quote. It's a really good <laughs> one. <laughs> um, and, you know, as the only person that was an expert in my own life, <laughs> I, I had to lean into what I, I didn't really want to do, but I'm grateful that I did. Mm -hmm. And I celebrate going back into this, like interpreting on a collegiate level world, because without that, I wouldn't know the struggle that people have. I wouldn't mm -hmm. know that. Um, I wouldn't know that college students don't always get what they need when asked right away. I wouldn't know that. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be... You know, some of my students call me their emotional support interpreter because I'm always like, oh, I think it's really cute. That's <laughs> <But> so sweet. <laughs> because they're like, oh, well, you like get everything. And I was yeah. like, oh, I'm older, oh. but also like you deserve these things. These are yours. You have a right. Learn about your rights. Advocate for what you need. Get that job done. Because at the end of the day, the only person that can actually get everything is you. Mm -hmm. And all of those sort of like, moments so all of that tragedy and like it was two years of just like up and down unsure and then all over gutted and and just you ch it changes your whole perspective but 
you know, 2020 was hard for everybody, but that wasn't my hardest year. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think I like cried yeah. a little bit in 2020. No, um, but like, no, I listen, that- I, I say this like every episode of the podcast, I did thrive in 20. Like it was Absolutely. such a terrible year for so many people. I was very lucky that it was a great year for me. So yeah, no, feel free to say that. If you great. thrived, you yeah. thrived. That's your story. I was thriving. I, I, de- I definitely had moments where, I mean, like, there's a lot of family stuff that I have to deal with. There's a lot of like sad things that go on on behind the scenes of like, you know, what I'm putting out there. But listen, like when you've got a responsibility to your own life and you've got to get stuff done, mm-hmm. the only person that's stopping you is you. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, that's, that's a hard lesson to learn. That's a hard lesson to even think about. But in mm-hmm. 2020, the only barrier at that time was work. And that that got easier because I got to be here, you know, backdrop's different, but like I got to be in a space where I got to be in a space where I could utilize the skills that I have on multiple fronts, create the change that I needed to create because everything was online. And not only that, as the world started opening up and these protests started to happen, we had actual space to really give people what they needed. And I think on so many levels, connecting with people became so much easier. And that is, if you know, my jam is my like bread and butter is like connecting people together. That Mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. And if I can get you to that right person, I've made my, my day's made. I don't need to do anything else. Yeah. Um, And what a beautiful thing to sort of live out your purpose and having that be something you're also good at. Like what a beautiful intersection of things to work out. Um, In a recent episode, we talk about the Japanese concept of Ikigai which Mm. was like, from what I understand, and Manuel, who was on that episode, can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like where your purpose meets what the world needs, meets what you're good at. And it's like, congrats, like you found yours. This is so cool. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it it takes a lot of like practice and being gracious for what you have and gracious for the time that it takes to earn, to earn that space and to create that space really in your life and Mm -hmm. like really acknowledge it. Yeah. You know, and even talking to you about it isn't fully acknowledging the fact that I, you know, I can go out there tomorrow and do that. I know that I'm doing that, but also like, That's incredible. even my therapist says like, oh, you know, you're really into this advocacy thing. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I <know. laughs> um, but I think that it's, it, you know, it, it just, it teaches you so much about who you are as a person and what you can bring to the table. Um, And that sort of is just a reflection of everything in your life. And I think that I've been given this gift of being able to get what I want as an only child, but also using it for a good purpose. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) I love that. I love that. Totally. It's hard to tell me no. (laughs) Good as it should, as it should. (laughs) Um, Next question. How have you worked to change how you perceive the world around you? Have you worked to change your thoughts and beliefs into ones that serve you and create a world that you want to live in? Well, I think you got to be a part of the change. You got to buy into your own, you know, conversation that you're having with so many people. And if you don't want to be a part of the change, you don't have space to sort of be upset about it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And I have created for me, I know that I surround myself with people that also want that. They also mm-hmm. want to see change in the world. Maybe our change is from different perspectives, right? You know, maybe their change is not the change that I want to see. So like mm-hmm. now I have somebody to sort of like contend with. Um, but also like just making sure that at every juncture, you're reminding yourself of all the stuff you've been through, mm-hmm. of all the things you want to do, and making space for all the things that will get help you to get to your ultimate goal and help mm-hmm. you to get to you know your next healthy kind of like situation that you want to be in and i think mm-hmm. that um the conversation and the how i've sort of shaped all of this has always been the heartbeat of like community advocacy service and like making sure that all of those things sort of are interconnected in that intersectionality of like knowing exactly how I want to get that ball like kind of going and that keep, keep that like momentum going forward. Yeah. That's so So having like a heartbeat. How do you create that space for yourself where you mentioned like pausing, acknowledging what I've been through, acknowledging what it takes for me to get to that next healthy place I want to be in how, like that makes total sense to me. Uh, but as a 25 year old, I'm like, how, how do you make that space? 
it's it's a it's a process. Um, I think that I have had to go on a little bit of an emotional journey this year um, with some family stuff. But I have, you know, like the one thing that I always hear is like, "Well, go do all the self care, and it'll it'll fix you." It's like, sure, sure. Uh, I hate that. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I hate I'm like, listen. I live a mile away from the woods. I go in there almost every day. But it's not self care. It's a walk in. The- it's a walk in the woods, you know? Right, like, like I hate the, like, listen, I will say the term self-care because it resonates with people, but I hate that term. It's like a bath bomb will not fix my anxiety. Not at all. I don't even own a bath bomb. I don't even want to take a bath. Also, gross. <laughs> listen, I agree. Okay, we're but ready I here as a strong think... anti-bath bomb stance. <laughs> you join our club, maybe a shower fizzy here and there, but never sure. a bath bomb. <laughs> Thank you. (laughs) But uh, no, I think, I really think it's a journey of like, you know, you've got all these experiences and, you know, you've seen my resume. I'm pretty open about it. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. I came to school. I came to the idea that I needed an education much later on than everybody else. I felt like I needed life first and then I needed an education. And I think I did that. Um, And I always found myself to be the youngest in the room, which is funny because now I find myself to be the oldest in the room, which is a very weird brain thing for me. But um, being the youngest in the room helps you create, helps you understand what you've been through has nothing to do with what these people are talking about, but like, you need to know where you are in this world, right? You mm-hmm. still have so much, you personally as a 25 year old has so much world to live in, mm-hmm. but me as an older person has, has, you know, I've lived those things. So find people that you talk to that have that sort of like depth of experience maybe that you want that same experience or just to have a conversation with. So the conversations Mm -hmm. that you have on a regular basis probably resonates a lot with you and you sort of have to do a lot of like analyzing from there. Mm -hmm. Right. So like once you, once you hear other everybody else's experiences, you're immediately gaining more perspective than you had before. Mm -hmm. So with that said, I just feel like when I think about my life and I think about all the you know, community service things I've done and all the, you know, fancy boards that I've been on. And I had to like pay money to like go to galas and stuff like that Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. talk to strangers and, you know, be, be in situations where (laughs) for me, it was not the easiest, Mm -hmm. but for them, this was like, that's their life. They like go to galas and they do fancy things and they have these important conversations and like, they care about this with money great you know I love when people care about things that are less you know that that they don't quite understand with the donation but also you really do learn from them about why you why they care and that that's sort of you bring that with you you bring Mm -hmm. that with you to the next conversation so taking all these little bits of things that you've been through keeping them with you bringing out that puzzle piece that you sort of like the puzzle of your life that you sort of want to like create right you're sort of in this space that you're like, okay, well, here's this A, B, C, I have all the pieces, I'm still learning. So you're still adding to this puzzle. So as that puzzle sort of creates that space, you know, the sort of visual space of this puzzle, you're just adding to it. So taking Mm -hmm. time to like, look at that bigger picture. I have all these pieces. I have all these moments that I've created. I have all these like experiences that I have and experiences that I want, how do I get there? Mm -hmm. And so, just making, always looking at that big picture, because at the end of the day, you'll find your heartbeat of what you always have done. And I think for me, once you're, you hit a certain age, you're like, oh, right. Mm. These are the things that I'm good at. Stop trying to do something else. (laughs) That's not working for you. Sure, sure. You know, like if you're good at, you know, basket weaving and then suddenly like and you're so good at it and then you're like you know I'm gonna try actually deep sea diving like don't do that just don't you know it's yeah, silly yeah, yeah, but yeah. like don't do that so it's a silly and very like rudimentary sort of analogy but th- on the same token that's like everything that's like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if you're not a runner don't run yeah but also try walking it burns the same amount of calories like <laughs> oh yeah 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 I used to be a personal trainer and I could not express more the benefits of walking like yeah. walking is so freaking good for you so yeah it's a complete aside but yeah you're totally right yeah no same you know I again like mm-hmm. there are days when I don't feel like I haven't really been running but like I have been walking 
That was, that was the same. In your woods you go- that are a mile from yeah. your house that I'm so jealous yeah. of. <laughs> Come visit. We can go for a walk in the woods. Yeah, yeah. Don't have to ask me twice. Self-care. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely no bath bombs. <laughs> awesome. So final question. Tell me the story that you've created for yourself. I have created uh, a story of somebody who um, doesn't let a lot of things keep her down. There's a lot of stuff. There's so many barriers to going after what you want. There's so many barriers to making sure that other people have what they need. And you, you gotta be okay with hearing no. You have to be okay with it but don't let that stop you. Mm -hmm. And I have created a story of wanting to do more for the world that I was born in and making it a better place than how I found it. And I think at the end of the day, the space that I, or the, this sort of chapter that I'm in now, that's, I'm doing it through communication and advocacy. I'm doing it through making sure people have what they need in order to have a better um, future. And, you know, making sure that I have what I need to have a better future. Um, and I think that those are the, that heartbeat that I talk about of going through, you know, being a part of your community, learning what they need. And then at the end of the day, just making sure that you, you having that presence and space in their lives is for the good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Thank you so, so much for taking time to talk with me. This is a super interesting conversation and I am happy to link whatever you want to share in the, in the description of this podcast. And also as I'm like promoting the episode, whatever Mm -hmm. you'd like to share, send it my way and it'll be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will just say like, if you are thinking about learning sign language, make sure you learn sign language from a deaf person. Um, just like you wouldn't learn Spanish from like a Greek person or you wouldn't try to learn, <laughs> you know, it's just not going to, it's not your native language. Um, yeah, yeah. So making sure you're learning deaf, uh, sign language from a person that is deaf, it is their language, it's their culture, it's their space, and they should be honored for teaching. Totally, totally. Great notes to leave us off with. And thank you. 